Come, bow down and worship. Kneel to the Lord, our Maker. This is our God, our Shepherd. We are the flock led with care. And as we gather together on this first Sunday of Lent, we know that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And now grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen.
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. O God of peace, we have built up walls to protect ourselves from our enemies, but those walls also shut us off from receiving your love. Break down those walls. Help us to see that the way to your heart is through the reconciliation of our own hearts with our enemies. Bless them and us that we may come to grow in love for each other and for you. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Jesus Christ, truly God, at the same time truly human and truly righteous, is the mediator who was given to set us completely free and to make us right with God. By the power of his divinity, he bore the weight of God's anger in his humanity, restoring us to righteousness and life. And it is in his name that I proclaim to you that your sins are forgiven. God has embraced you as God's very own. God has made you a new creation. The question then is how do we respond? How do we show our gratitude for God's love and mercy and forgiveness? These words from Micah, chapter 6, verse 8 give us good guidance on how we ought to live. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. Our Psalter reading is from Psalm 25. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly tre treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. <laughs> Shall 
Good morning. It's time for a word for the children. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. I wonder if the children know why Lent is a special season. Lent is the 40 days leading up to Easter. It is a time for us to grow closer to God as we try to follow the example of Jesus. How do we do this? During Lent, we pray and study and think about all that Jesus has done for us. At this time, some people like to help others by serving those in need. Others make a sacrifice by giving up something they enjoy, like coffee or chocolate. What if we gave up a negative behavior so that our little corner of the world could become a better place. Let's think about that. It's normal to be a little grumbly and negative when things aren't going our way. As we go through our days, we may fall into a pattern of noticing things that disappoint us or we wish would be different. Some days, there is plenty to grumble about. Many people are suffering. We have real reasons to feel gloomy. Here's something you might not know. Christians should expect to suffer and not be surprised when we do. This might seem like a bitter truth, but think about this. Christ also suffered once for our sins. Jesus suffered to bring you closer to God. Remembering the sacrifice of Christ helps us put our problems in perspective, doesn't it? Perspective is our way of looking at something. It's our point of view. If we look for what is wrong, we will certainly find it in our world. We cannot control the things that happen to us but we can control our perspective. Think about this. Is the glass half empty or is it half full? The awareness of our control over our attitude can be our challenge to change. Maybe we can try to find another behavior to take the place of grumbling. What can we do instead? We can be grateful. We can look for the good and the positive that is all around us each day. Will a positive attitude change our lives? Maybe not. We will still have problems and real reasons to be angry or sad. We will have days when we suffer, but we will also have many reasons to give thanks. We can rejoice, grump, we can replace grumbling with gratitude. We can trade negative feelings for hope. And we can be joyful because gratitude helps us grow closer to God. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus who suffered so that we might grow close to you. Help us remember we are the privileged children of God. Each day, may we focus on gratitude, joy, and hope with thanks for the sacrifice of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As God's dear children, then, take him as your pattern and follow Christ by loving as he loved you, giving himself up for us as an offering and a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God.
Let us pray. You, O Lord, are the author and giver of all good things. Lead us into a more perfect gratitude through which we may also become givers of good things. Make our Lenten disciplines one of joy and sacrifice through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear the word of God. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And then a reading from the epistles, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. And baptism, which is prefigured, now saves you not as a removal, removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven in and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. And then the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, the baptism of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A 2018 article by two psychologists started with these words. Americans find an alarming number of things to complain about. Apparently, the rate of complaints in American conversations ranges from 70 to 84 percent. And yet, none of us likes to hang out with a complainer. According to the authors, we were born with brains that have a negative bias. We tend to focus on things that are not right, rather than attending to all the rightness around us, says Dr. B, one of the authors. When this tendency to complain turns into a habit, the world quickly becomes an unpleasant or dangerous place. And our fellow human beings become a constant source of irritation instead of a companion on life's journey. The authors then give seven strategies to be more aware of your own complaining, to hear yourself complaining. Number one, step back. Look at the bigger picture. Will this still matter in five months or years from now? Number two, look within. Does the small irritating issue represent a theme or a larger issue in your life? Number three, make a game of it. Wear a bracelet or a rubber band on one wrist. When you complain, switch it to the opposite wrist. Try to go 30 days without switching it. Number four, Choose the right channel. Privately share your issue, not on Facebook. Number five, air valid concerns. Your complaint may address a genuine need that can lead to a solution. Number six, find the positives. When you have a complaint, start and end with a positive. And the last one, Practice gratitude. Remind yourself each day about one thing you are grateful for. These are helpful suggestions, and we all could probably benefit implementing them. At the same time, the last year has been a difficult one for all of us. We were collectively challenged, and one could even say that the year 2020 was a perfect storm. The definition of a perfect storm, in short, is something like this. A particularly bad or critical state of affairs arising from a number of negative and unpredictable factors. Now, I can think of a number of negative and unpredictable factors that happened over the last 12 months. The pandemic political, economic, and social factors come to mind. Yes, the world has become a bit hostile to all of us. And for human, human beings born with brains that have a negative bias, we certainly can find a lot to complain about. I think that the beautiful written letter of First Peter is helpful to live with gratitude and joy 
in spite of a world that could be unfriendly, hostile, and outright dangerous. Peter's letter gives a profound view on who Jesus Christ is. It gives a clear vision for the Christian church, and it gives instruction on what Christian life in the world should look like. And it does so against the backdrop of persecution and physical suffering. I think that once again, God's word comes to us as a living word, relevant for our time and right for our circumstance. Peter's first readers had good reason to complain, questioning their fate, and even, in, even wondering if it is all worth holding on to. They suffered. And Peter calls them exiles and aliens. This is to be understood that their real home is heaven, and they are exiles in the world for the time being. Now, some scholars suggest that the first readers were not Roman citizens. They were foreigners who are in, on the margins of the society. Now, it is possible that some readers were indeed non-citizens or foreigners, but Peter is affirming that all of them, all of them, Roman citizens and non-Romans alike, are citizens of heaven. They are undergoing suffering, and Peter is giving them advice on how to deal with their suffering. The word suffering appears in this short letter more times than any other book of the New Testament. So the recipients of Peter's letter would have had enough reasons to complain. How does Peter comfort and encourage them in their difficult situation? Peter does so in various ways. He points out that they have been chosen and destined by God. They are not alone. They all belong to the body of Christ. He reminds them that they acquired a privileged status when they joined God's household. He reminds them that they are children of God, their Father. They are purchased by the precious gift of the blood of Christ. They are a people set apart from the rest of the world, belonging to God alone. And he tells them that they are the place of God's residence, God's temple. And he continues that they should expect to suffer and not be surprised when they do, for Christ himself suffered. Peter thus points out that even though they are suffering, they have many reasons to rejoice and to be grateful. God, who has called them, is holy and therefore they too should be holy. This is God's eternal word. So we too are the recipients of Peter's letter. We too can hold on to Peter's words of comfort and encouragement. We are not alone. We belong to the body of Christ. We too are children of God. We too are part of God's household. We too have received a new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Christ. For the same reasons, we need not complain when we feel like aliens and foreigners living in a hostile and dangerous world. During this Lenten journey towards Easter, we are reminded that new life comes through the suffering and death of Christ on Good Friday. It is possible to rejoice and to be grateful even as we are trying to make sense of life and this very complex world. This letter comes to us, and we have to admit 
When the world throws curveballs at us, we complain. When people who knowingly or unknowingly make life difficult for us, we often want to retaliate. We want to hit back and show them a thing or two. Peter suggests that his readers back then and the readers today conduct themselves honorably so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God. He continues to them back then and to us, if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval because Christ also suffered for you. His words back then are as relevant today when he says, have unity in spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse with abuse. Repay with a blessing. We know, as surely as Peter's readers knew back then, that to repay evil with good and abuse with a blessing is never easy. We know, as they knew back then, that the natural and normal response to intimidation and unkind actions is to strike back. Today, it is almost expected to show strength. Otherwise, people may think, that you are weak. So we often resort to the philosophy of an eye for an eye. But such an approach has its own consequences, as Gandhi said, an eye for an eye will leave the whole world blind. And then Peter presents us with his most convincing argument. This is what he says. For Christ also suffered for sins, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. Yes, Peter continues saying, Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So Peter is presenting the suffering Christ to them and to us as an example. But Christ is more than an example. His suffering was unique. It was once for all. And Peter falls back on the theological cornerstone for the church. Christ is the innocent and righteous one who gives his life for sinners and for those who are unrighteous. And here is the purpose of Christ's sacrifice Christ suffered, gave his life in order to bring you to God. Christ, through his suffering, death, and resurrection, brings us to God. This theological truth is meant to strengthen the readers and us today when life treats us unkindly. Christ has brought us to God, and God has embraced us for Christ's sake. Each and every temptation, hardship, and challenge pale in comparison of what Christ has already done for us. And as people of faith, we find strength and comfort in this theological truth. However, there are times when doubt seeps in. There are times when life's burdens are too heavy and we question these theological truths. Sometimes we question the reach of Christ's work. And then we ask questions like, did Jesus really bring me to God? Why don't I feel this? Why am I not sure? To those of you with these questions, the answer is clear, yes. Christ did it for you. Christ brought you to God. Other times we want to limit the reach of Christ's work to those 
who think like us, those who live like us, and those who are like us. In other words, instead of finding hope, comfort, and strength in what Christ accomplished for us through his suffering, death, and resurrection, we want to ration God's grace. The fact is that God's love, in the words of the Apostle Paul, is wider, longer, and higher and deeper than we can ever imagine. In fact, God's love surpasses our knowledge. And Peter comes to the same conclusion, albeit in different words. Actually, verses 19 through 20 are a bit confusing. It states that Jesus went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey. Most scholars agree that the author of the Apostles' Creed used this text when they wrote, Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, day he rose again from the dead. He descended into hell to proclaim victory to those who are dead. But scholars do not agree who these spirits in prison were. Some say these are the faithful in the Old Testament. Others say they are the ones who perished in Noah's flood. Others suggest that these are the so-called sons of God in Genesis 6. Now, I agree with New Testament scholar Carl Hermann Schelke, who suggests that Jesus' proclamation to the spirits in prison reveals the saving grace of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. God's love in Christ penetrates the depths of all the earth. In other words, there is no limit to God's grace. Furthermore, God's love and grace in Christ is for all times, the past, the present, and the future. Any and all efforts, then, to place limitations on the reach of God's love and grace in Christ do not do justice to Peter's words. Peter is presenting this powerful message of God's unlimited love and grace for all times and for all as a comfort to those suffering Christians. All they had to do was to hold on to the hope even as their world, their enemies, and the life and life itself challenge them. And this is the same message that has strengthened and encouraged millions of people for 2,000 years. And it still does the same for us. Peter continues his letter urging them to respond to their challenges not by complaining, but by maintaining love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. To be hospitable to one another without complaining, and to serve one another with whatever gift each has received. And this reflection would not be complete without referring to a few more verses as, as examples of what to do instead of complaining. Hear these words. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert, knowing that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. As we are hopeful that things will be better soon in our world, let us remind ourselves of God's unlimited loving grace in Christ. 
Let us remember that we too belong to the body of Christ. Let us focus on doing good deeds instead of complaining. And let us embrace with joy and gratitude God's gifts to us. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith in the living God, and we do so in the words from the Iona community. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life, and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that waits to enslave us all, and whose love, defeating even death, is our glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and full of doubt, in God we trust, and in the name of Jesus Christ we commit ourselves in the service of others to care for the earth and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness, to live in the freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love, and in the company of the faithful, so to be the church for the glory of God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. From the rising of the sun to its setting, we praise your holy name, O God. We thank you for our breath and our bread and for your love which passes understanding. We praise you for Jesus Christ, his embrace of us in death and his resurrection on Easter day. Make us one in him and with his story, that his suffering may give, give meaning to our darkest hours, his grace overcome our guilt, and his victory give us courage to face the powers of death in our world and make a difference for life. Lead us in this Lenten season from darkness to light, from fear to hope, and from death to resurrection in the company of him who is near to all who seek, ask, and trust, even Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, who has taken upon yourself the world's suffering and injustice, we pray for people in pl painful places today, for victims of violence near and far away and for their families, for the hungry in a world that could feed all, for children neglected and children who receive so much that they imagine they are the center of the world, for people hurt by failure in school, in work, in a relationship. Give them comfort and courage in time to try again. As always, we pray for the aged, the sick, and those recovering, commending them to your caring presence and healing power. Today, we pray especially for Patty Alheim's uncle Jerry and Aunt Betty. We pray for Carolyn Cromer, for Dave Gordon, Doug's father, and for his family, for Craig DeRusso, for Shauna Hamilton, Shannon Jadiski, and Miss Vera, Ben Hodder's friends, for Eric, Mandy, and Jared Myers, for Sharon and Bob Ryder, for our homebound members. 
We continue to pray for everyone who has been affected by the pandemic. I pray for my brother Marius, who's back in hospital, still struggling with the after effects of COVID. We pray for all refugees, for victims of natural disasters, war and violence. Especially we pray for people in the southern states who have been affected by the winter storm. Be close to them, we pray. We give thanks, O Lord, that life is good, even when it's hard, because it's not our creation, but your gift. We give thanks that life is good, even when it's hard, because you have faced it too, and walked the valley of the shadow all the way to the cross. Walk with us in this new week that we may do the Father's will, love our friends and our enemies, return good for evil, give and not count the cost, and share the joy of the journey to life eternal. In your strong name we ask it all. And hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying in one voice, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. of God, when life becomes hard 
and the world unpredictable, remember that you belong to the body of Christ. You are a child of God. You were purchased by the precious gift of the blood of Christ. Remember this and be grateful and live in joy. And as you do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.